Burrs. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to already, there's an excellent exhibit in the Forestburg Gallery, which is just down here, on pressed prairie grass. It's done by a person by the name of Erin Edmondson, who's originally from Iowa, and uh, she did a residency at the Tallgrass Prairie at New and I, so it's all we're seeing. Uh, it's great that we have that for the Sierra Club. Uh, we are having the speak speakers and the panel video tape today will be on YouTube later. Uh, this is being done by Mike Darden. Uh, are you going to be taking questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Professor Anderson uh, will be taking questions, uh, but you'll need one of these microphones. We have two of them here. So we'll make arrangements for somebody to hold one. Might be me, but we'll give it to you if you have a question. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add is that this is not on the program, but I think everybody knows our involvement in trying to stop uh, the carbon dioxide pipelines and eminent domain issues and everything else. We're going to get an update from uh, our staff at Jess Missouri. That will be after the panel. And uh, I think everything else will be on schedule. So we'll go ahead and I'm going to introduce Professor Anderson, who's our keynote speaker. He is the dean at the Drake Law School. Uh, he teaches environmental law school and environmental law there as well. He's also been involved as an attorney in uh, environmental law cases. And he will be uh, making a presentation. As he said, there will be questions at the end. I think he's also going to be using the PowerPoint. So anyway, uh, uh, Jerry, come on up and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Well, it's really great to be among friends, so to speak, people that care about, about these issues. Um, and it is also, I just want to give uh, a shout out to uh, Wally Taylor, who, uh, when I, I came to Iowa in 1991, uh, so 30 years ago, and I asked around to see who was uh, doing public interest environmental work at that time, and everybody said, uh, there's really only one person in the whole state of Iowa, and that's Wally Taylor, uh, doing this kind of work in his spare time for free, uh, which is not what really you see uh, in other states. And so uh, over the years, uh, we've worked together on, on several cases, and, uh, and, and here we are 30 years later, and really, you ask around today, who does environmental work in the state of Iowa, and it's basically uh, still Wally Taylor, so, so I just, I just want to uh, say how much I really respect the work that he's done, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of free work over the years to try to make a difference. And it's like, I always talk about, you know, there's plenty of lawyers on the other side, uh, as you know, I mean, there's plenty of firepower on the other side, and it's really hard to keep the tree growing straight when you've got the wind just blowing on one side of the tree. Uh, and so Wally's doing everything he can to try to even that out, and, and we need more of him uh, in the state of Iowa, but I'm not sure where that's going to come from. So um, thank you again to Wally. And I'm really excited, too, to hear the panelists this afternoon and, and learn from, from all that expertise we have on how we can make things better uh, in the state of Iowa. And, and I'm here to just give you a background on the Clean Water Act at 50 years old. So, um, you know, if you think back to 50 years ago, and I, I've got to do this manually, I guess, because I, I didn't bring the proper equipment, but um, some of us can actually remember 50 years ago, and, and uh, you know, looking around, I can see that I'm not alone probably in remembering those days, but, um, you know, we do, I, I am a, I, I've got a lot of critique of the Clean Water Act, and we can get into why it's not working as well as we'd like it to. But this is supposed to be a celebration of the Clean Water Act at 50, so I want to start by saying, yes, it was a remarkable achievement in 1972. And it was not the only remarkable achievement around that time. Uh, and we'll talk about just the environmental decade of the 1970s. Uh, that resulted in a lot of, you know, basically all the cornerstone environmental uh, laws that we know today. 
And so you, you ask yourself, well, what was going on in the late 1960s and early 1970s that, that led to a, a, a large consensus that we needed to do something like the Clean Water Act? And so, of course, you had a lot more environmental awareness. Uh, and, and you see uh, Rachel Carson's book there and, and many other um, things like that that raised the, the public's awareness of these environmental issues. <coughs> You know, Congress, you get Congress's attention on the first Earth Day in 1970 when you have 100,000 people walking down Fifth Avenue protesting about environmental uh, conditions. And then the same number gathered on the Mall in Washington, D.C. on the first Earth Day. That gets the attention of Congress. Uh, and you had really reached the carrying capacity of our waters. I mean, Back in the old days, you could, you could, you know, the water can handle a certain amount of pollution and, and it can um, deal with it. But by the late 1960s and the early 1970s, what you call the carrying capacity of those uh, waters had been reached. And so you had things like the Cuyahoga River catching on fire because of the amount of pollution that was in it. And so when a river catches on fire and you have to have put a sign up on the Cuyahoga River that says it's flammable, <laughs> you know you have an issue, right? So we had reached a point where, you know, it was really a crisis that Congress had to do something about. And so for the first time in 1972, you had a national law that prohibited the discharge of any pollutant into the waters of the United States without a permit. And so that statement, Section 301 of the Clean Water Act, is, is really remarkable in its breadth, right? You cannot discharge a pollutant into a water of the United States without getting a permit. And then to get a permit, you had to show that you were meeting the best available technology standards, so you had to be using technology. So up until that time, you saw factories dumping into the streams. You, you had um, basically raw sewage in a lot of places being dumped in the rivers. And you're not going to see that. And so we do have to recognize, and again I say I, I've got a lot of critique of, of the Clean Water Act, but we do have to recognize what a signal achievement that was that from now on we're going to have this uh, blanket prohibition against pollution all across the United States. So there were some local laws before that, and certainly there were laws like the River and Harbors Act that had been passed back in the 1890s that prohibited some large-scale types of pollution, but uh, this was really a, a comprehensive in scope. And you can see that, you know, that was not alone in the 1970s. We started with NEPA in uh, the first day of the January 1st of 1970, and then we had the Clean Air Act in 1970, and you can see all that alphabet soup there, FIFRA and TOSCA, uh, Endangered Species Act, and, and RICRA, which was the hazardous waste law. So Congress, you know, today it's remarkable that Congress can do anything. And isn't it amazing that in that decade of the 70s, it was bang, 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 clean air, clean water, FIFRA, uh, which is the Insecticide, Pesticide Act, uh, Endangered Species Act, and so on, that just one after another, they, they really dealt with a lot of these uh, issues. But in the end, you know, we have this remarkable growth in regulation. So when we talk about the, the Clean Water Act and why it's not working as well, let's recognize that it's not because we haven't thrown enough words at it, right? Because this is the growth of environmental regulation, and I do this every so often, it looks like I need to update this slide because, of, because it's gotten even, even greater since then, but you can see that the environmental regulations to, for the title that deals with the protection of the environment in 1972, you could read in, in 50 minutes, and now we have a remarkable growth in environmental regulation, and the question that we're gonna have then is why isn't it getting us to where we want to go. So we know that we're not where we want to go. And the general idea that I'd just like to, to throw out there is that 1972, this was a remarkable achievement, the Clean Water Act. 
It used technology-based standards for point source pollution. We got rid of most of what we call the low-hanging fruit of industrial type, factory type pollution. But that was 1972. We had one update, major update in 1987. But really, the Clean Water Act that we're dealing with 50 years later is essentially the same Clean Water Act that we had in 1972. Now, how many things do you, are you using today that were invented 50 years ago and haven't been updated? Are you still you know, using the same car you know, from 50 years ago? Are you still using this, the same you know, uh, oven uh, or anything, right? The computer uh, has advanced just a little bit, right? So we're, we're basically using a Model T car on the Autobahn of our problems today. And we're trying to make the, the Model T car work. We're tinkering with it as much as we can. But the fact is that our tools in our environmental toolkit have, have advanced substantially over the last 50 years. But Congress has not updated the framework of our mechanism for dealing with it in that time. And so the problem that we see is that it isn't doing what it needs to be doing. And we'll just talk a little bit about, we're kind of done with the celebrating part now. <laughs> and now we'll just go move in right into, you know, some of the things that I know our panelists are probably going to talk about this afternoon. So we know that we have uh, this remarkable number of impaired waters on the impaired waters list. One, one of the cases that I worked on with Wally back when I first got here was uh, the TMDL lawsuit. Because when, when in, in the 1990s, um, Iowa had not done one, what they call, what they call now water quality improvement plan for, for waters that were impaired. And at that time, there were 200, what was it, like about 212 waters on the impaired list in the 1990, late 1990s, something like that. 190, no, I think it was 198. At most, yeah. Yeah, and so um, when we brought that suit, we, we sued um, the state of Iowa, and we said, you know, the Clean Water Act has a lot of shortcomings, but one of the things it does require is that if you list an impaired water, you have to do a, a, a water quality improvement plan for it so that you can eventually get it off of the impaired waters list. So Iowa had not done any of them and did not plan to do any of them. Um, we met with the DNR director and we said, what's your plan on this? He said, I'm not going to do them. I don't think they're any good. So we sued them and we got a 10-year schedule for doing these um, what they call total maximum daily load calculations where you try to figure out how much pollution will, will get the water back into the, uh, the uh, meeting the water quality standards um, and put them on a 10 year schedule for doing those, which they met. They did you know, 200 of these water quality improvement plans. And today we have uh, a total of Somebody probably knows the exact number that I have to read off this that I can't read here. Seven, it's like 700 impaired waters on the impaired waters list. Oh, yeah. Um, Seven impaired waters. It's like over three times the amount that were on the, the impaired waters list in the 1990s. And the list is not, not getting short. And I would say that, and this is just a map of, of the impaired segments. Um, this chart gives you a little different view of it. Of the waters that they have uh, enough data for, you've got 56% of the waters that they, that they have enough data for that are not meeting water quality standards. Um, this is a little pie chart that shows that, uh, you know, so the, so the green part is impaired. The orange part is we need to know more about it. Uh, and then the blue part is the ones that are not impaired. And so, and then the little yellow part is the ones that are fully meeting 
water quality here. So we have, you know, very few of our waters that we can say for sure are meeting water quality standards at this point. So I'm sorry to depress you, but it also is true that even that doesn't tell a complete picture because we don't have numeric water quality standards for two of the most ubiquitous pollutants in the state of Iowa. We all know that nutrient pollution is a huge problem. We do not have numeric water quality standards for nitrogen and phosphorus. That really limits DNR's ability to identify <coughs> water segments as being for nutrients. They can if it violates the drinking water nitrate standard, which they have in Des Moines uh, on the raccoon. They've done that, but very few segments in Iowa are drinking water segments. They can do it if it results in uh, eutrophication to the extent that they can say that it's impaired uh, because it, it, it violates the narrative standards. But if we had numeric standards, we would probably see a lot more water skin added to the list, or a lot more impairments certainly added to that list. So we know that another issue is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is this huge area. You know, when you look at this map, you're just, it just it boggles your mind to know that this is an area where dissolved oxygen levels are so low that aquatic life cannot survive, which is why it's dead, a dead zone. And it is a remarkably huge area that is coming from us and other places in the upper Midwest. The nitrogen and phosphorus that we put into the waters here find their way to the Gulf of Mexico uh, and contribute to that hypoxia zone. So we know that that's another issue that is not being addressed by the Model T uh, that we have of the Clean Water Act today. So I'll just point out a few um, shortcomings of this Clean Water Act that hopefully the panelists will talk about later on today about some of the things that we might do. But one of the things that we know in Iowa is that over 90% of our pollution comes from non-point source pollution. And when the Clean Water Act was passed, the decision was made to focus solely on end of pipe point source pollution. Part of the issue was that when you get into non-point source pollution, which is the diffuse runoff that you might have on a golf course to a, to a, to a field of corn, you start getting into land use issues, and those are traditionally left to the states to handle rather than the federal government. And so they left those up to the state. Problem being that when you get to Iowa, you, you have most of our pollution coming, and certainly most of our remaining pollution coming from non-point source pollution. So when you get to the Raccoon River problem, for example, 90% of the, the nitrates are coming from runoff uh, and are not dealt with by the Clean Water Act. So this is a huge problem. When they did the water quality improvement plan that Wally and I made them do, it took many years to do, it cost many thousands of dollars to do, it's a document that is like 200 pages long and contains lots of charts and graphs and studies showing exactly where the problem is coming from. And in the end, they say, okay, well, now we know where the problem is coming from. What are we going to do about it? Answer, we can't do anything about it. We don't have any authority to do anything about it because it's coming from non-point source pollution. And so all we can do is a voluntary approach where we try to encourage people to do the right things. If we get grant money, we can install wetlands in, in some crucial areas. But in the end, we can't do anything 
about this 90% of the problem that we know to be the cause of the pollution in the Raccoon River. So that, the, this Raccoon River one is just one example of that which occurs time after time in Iowa. That DNR knows what the problem is. They know where the problem is coming from. But they don't have any authority to do anything about it because the Federal Clean Water Act applies only to the point sources and the state, like most other states in the country, has not had the political will to do anything about that part of the issue, right? So, that's a problem. The other problem has to do with jurisdiction. Uh, and so, the Supreme Court, this term, will hear yet another Clean Water Act case involving the reach of federal jurisdiction over the nation's waters. And it's Sackett versus EPA, if you want to look it up. Um, this is, has been going back since 1987, I think it was Riverside Baby and Holmes case. Uh, this is, so this has been going on, this tug of war on federal jurisdiction, since the 1980s. So the question is, where does, the, the Clean Water Act says the federal government has jurisdiction only over waters of the United States. And so the question is, what exactly is a water of the United States? How far back can the federal government reach when you're talking about small streams, wetlands adjacent to those streams, isolated wetlands, and so on. And so what we found is that Supreme Court has cut back on the federal government's ability to reach a lot of the most crucial uh, waters in the United States, including uh, isolated wetlands. So I mean, if you look at, at the hydrology you know, cycle, you, you see that, I mean, you, you know, yes, they have jurisdiction over the Mississippi River. Yes, they have jurisdiction over the Yellow River. But as you start getting further back, and you talk about you know, things that certainly impact that watershed, the federal government loses their ability to control what happens uh, in those areas. So again, that was supposed to be, this has been a fight for you know, 40 years, basically, over how far the federal government can go. And we have lost the ability to control what happens to many of the nation's wetlands because of the, the decisions that the, the EPA and the, and the Corps of Engineers just simply do not have the authority to uh, prohibit uh, destruction of those wetlands. So again, a shortcoming of the Clean Water Act. It was, it, 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 just to give you an indication, the Clean Water Act does not mention the word wetlands even though that is such a crucial part of the hydrological system, right? Such a crucial part of pollution control, wildlife habitat, flood control, and all those other things, Clean Water Act does not mention the word. So EPA has had to take this Model T car and try to tinker with it so that it reaches something that we know should be covered, but Congress didn't think about it at the time. It would be really, really great and the Supreme Court has even said this to Congress, it would be really, really great if you go back and amend the Clean Water Act to clarify this, right, and say exactly what waters are covered. But they haven't done it, and, and I don't think that they will do that. But what, what we would like to see happen, just like in the non-point source area, we'd like to see the states take up the slack. The whole point here is that, look, the federal government is a government of limited jurisdiction, and so they are not allowed under the Constitution to do certain things. And so, states, you need to get in the game. But many, many states will not do anything more than the federal government actually absolutely requires them to do. 
do, and I was one of them, basically. Some notable exceptions. So we cut back on the EPA's authority, hoping that states would step in and fill that gap. Most states have not done it. And so we have large water uh, areas that are not, simply just not covered, not protected by the Clean Water Act. Another area that the modern approach would cover, but the Model T does not, are contaminants of emerging concern. Clean Water Act was written at a time when our biggest problems were, you know, things that were floating in the water that you could see, um, you know, uh, big um, ubiquitous sorts of, 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 of uh, pollutants. But we know that there are a lot of pollution issues today that what we could call, you know, sort of things that are either modern in nature or are things that we just discovered are dangerous. So um, we have persistent organic pollutants. We've got uh, PFAS, you, you've probably heard about. We've got pharmaceuticals. We've got endocrine disruptors. We've got um, hormones. We've got uh, nanomaterials. You've seen all kinds of studies that show the, the amount of microplastics that are in our waters that, that are simply not covered by the Clean Water Act. And the mechanism that we have is, is what we call an end of pipe mechanism, right? You, you, you test the water at the end of the pipe and you make sure that it doesn't have too many suspended solids, you know, oxygen depleting material, some, some basic conventional type food it is not a good mechanism for dealing with these sorts of things that come, you can't control them at the end of the pipe. If, if a farmer is using hormones in their, uh, in their livestock and it gets into the urine and the urine then is, is, is part of the slurry that you put on your field and then that gets into the waterway your end of pipe regulation is not going to cover that. We have to have a different approach to it. And the, the Model T4 is not going to do it, right? So those are things that, um, those are just a few. And, and those you know, of us that have been working in this field for, for many years, we could go on and on about the shortcomings of the Clean Water Act because it is one of those things where, you know, for, for example, I'll just give you one more example, which is enforcement. I mean, you can have the law in the books, you, you pass the regulations, but if it's not enforced properly, then it's not going to do you any good, right? So, in a, a study that I'm doing right now, we're looking at the penalties that are uh, Clean Water Act penalties that are being uh, imposed across the country. EPA statute allows them to impose penalties of about $60,000 per day for a violation of the Clean Water Act. That's because they have very strong authority in the Clean Water Act and they have adjusted it for inflation over the last 50 years. It's been adjusted for inflation. Iowa DNR has the authority to impose $10,000 worth of penalties at the administrative level. That's, that's a number that has been in existence for 30 years, has not been adjusted, has not been adjusted for inflation, and is not likely to be adjusted at any time in the near future. So the differences between penalties imposed across the country are amazingly different in terms of the median penalties. You can find, you know, places like Wyoming where the average penalty is like $500 for a, a violation that would get you a penalty of $50,000 in another state. So uh, we do need to work on enforcement issues as well. 
and it is uh, a, another area that we, that we can talk about. So, let me talk about the future and, and give us some um, maybe ideas about what will give us hope and have for, for this. And again, let me just go back to what I said at the beginning. Yes, we should celebrate the fact that the Clean Water Act, we no longer have, you know, like junk cars in our, in, in our rivers and, and we don't have uh, things floating down. I, I, when I came in today, I saw an eagle fishing in the Cedar River and, and you didn't see that in 1972. Not necessarily because of the Clean Water Act, but because of DDT and, and, uh, and the effect on, on eagles. But, but we have, we should recognize that we have a lot of work. But where do we go from here? How do we make further improvement in what we're doing with, with the area of clean water? Well, one of the things that I think, just observing this over the last 30 years, is that we've gotten to this habit of thinking that EPA will solve our problems. Because we have all of these apps where the EPA, Congress said, we are going to stop water pollution. We are going to stop air pollution. We're going to stop hazardous waste. We've come to think of EPA as our guardian angel, right? As the one that's going to step in and, and, and do all our work for us. And what has resulted is that the regulated industries and, and farmers have come to see EPA as the enemy, right? And if EPA does something, that means we're against it. And we got to dig in our heels and we got to fight it. We don't want it. And you can understand that this is a natural reaction. We don't want people in Washington, D.C. telling us what to do. What do they know about the Cedar River? What do they know about Iowa? So we've gotten into this habit of, of making environmental law all about federal regulation. EPA led, right? And I think the problem with that is I, I just think back to, um, you know, sort of analogize it to the backyard football games that we used to play in my neighborhood when I was a kid. If there was a dispute on the field, you didn't go run to mom and dad. You dealt with it, right? And you figured out how to get along with those mean kids from across the street, right? And you figured out how to make it work. And today, you know, this is a whole other topic. <laughs> but you know, I, you know, sometimes you think that kids today are just involved in organized sports since the time they were five years old, and it's always about you know somebody that you can run to rather than working out the problem yourself. We always, you know, if something goes wrong, we're always going to go run to the authority figure instead of figuring out how to deal. So what I'm, I'm just suggesting is, there is a drawback to, to the, our approach to these issues and having it be federalized from the word go. And that is that we have lost, I think, to some extent, the responsibility for our own watersheds. To the extent that we can say, I don't care what the federal jurisdiction is. I don't care what the US Supreme Court decides in the second case. I don't care that the, clean, that the Federal Clean Water Act isn't dealing with this pollutant or that pollutant. I don't care that the Federal Clean Water Act doesn't deal with non-point source pollution. This is our river. This is our recreation, drinking water, fishing, swimming. This is our kids that are playing in this water. So why are we waiting for EPA and Congress to figure this out? Let's figure it out ourselves and demand it figured out ourselves, right? Instead of just saying, well, we're not going to do it if EPA doesn't make us do it. That's ridiculous, right? Because first of all, they're not going to do it. And so we need to pull up our socks and, and get it done ourselves. So that's one thing I would say. And did you see that? I mean, we did we did have a, um, a watershed uh, law passed a while back problem is it didn't really give those local watershed groups any authority and so again we, we have a, a little problem there. Uh, and then the last thing I would say if I can read my notes um, 
is that what we saw in the new um, approach to climate change, there's another area where over the last 20, 30 years we've been thinking about how can we deal with this issue and one of the, the ways that we thought about it was to model it after things like the Clean Water Act, which is called command and control regulation. And so maybe we should do it like the Clean Water Act and we should go in and we should make every uh, carbon emitter meet a certain standard and we should put technology-based controls on them and so on and so forth. And that was the, the Waxman-Markey bill that almost passed um, that would have mandated uh, a, a um, cap and trade system uh, that would be similar to what we did with acid rain. So what we see in the new approach to climate change is much more of an incentive-based system, right? And so how can we, you know, we understand that we've, we've about hit our limit with this Model T old-fashioned mechanism of command and control where, you know, if you think about it, it's really kind of mind-boggling that EPA set themselves the task to go into every single industry in the United States and try to figure out what the best technology for water pollution would be for everything from sugar plants to meat packing plants to paper mills to uh, municipal sewage plants. And so, they did that, it was an enormous task, but now those regs haven't changed for the, for, since they did it, because they don't want to go back and do, they can't, it, it, they, they have a term called ossification in, in environmental law, because it's just so <coughs> hard to change those regs, and the, and the amount of time and study and so on is so hard to do that you don't want to do it all again every five years. So the, the point is that we could use, uh, one of the things that I think is true, and, and uh, you can see this in many areas of environmental law, is that it is really hard to fight market forces. It's like you're, you're the, the, you know, the, the little Dutch boy in the dam, you know, and then there's a spring in the dam, and you put your finger in it, and then it springs out somewhere else. Market forces are like that water behind the dam. It is really hard to try to do something when the market forces are aligned against you. So the question is, how can we make the market forces work for us instead of against us? And we saw this with energy production, for example. I mean, one of the things that we debated 20 years ago in Iowa was whether to do a portfolio standard for energy and put, like they did in many states at that time, they were saying, each energy company in the state of Arizona, you have to get at least 30% of your energy from alternative energy sources by the year, you know, 2010 or whatever it was going to be. So those were portfolio standards that says, we're going to make you switch to this kind of power. Well, we never got that passed in Iowa. And yet, we are the leaders in the country in wind energy. And it wasn't because we said the Mid-American and Alliance, you have to do this. It's because they found it to be cost effective, right? I mean, they found it to be better for their consumers and cheaper than hauling coal in from Wyoming. And so how can we find ways to give people incentives to do better? Are there ways that it, it, it would be a lot easier to enforce, a lot easier, uh, and, and to use the power of the market to, to, to actually give people an incentive to come up with new and better ways of keeping the pollution out of our water would be wonderful. So, you know, they could be as simple as a tax on nutrients, you know, where you, you, you tax um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, for example, and then you take the five cents a, a pound and you and you use it for uh, installation of wetlands or buying buffer strips or whatever. Um, you know, so this is just a thought that as we go forward, it may be that we need to move beyond the 1972 approach 
of command and control. And the government's going to tell you exactly what to do. And move to an approach that's much more flexible and, and channels the, the great um, uh, innovation that is out there and incentivizes that innovation rather than uh, try, trying to have the government tell us what that's going to be. So we can, we can explore, I mean, the panelists might be able to explore that a lot more because I know there's a lot of innovation being done. It's just a question of how do you incentivize it and, and, and get it done. So I'm going to stop there and, and appreciate your attention and uh, we we'll take any questions. But, uh, so let's celebrate the fact that we did come up with the Model T in 1972, and it was a great innovation, just like the Wright Brothers airplane. Boy, I've got lots of analogies today. <laughs> but it was like, you know, we're not going to say the Wright Brothers airplane was a bad thing, right? I and mean, it was like, wow, that is really cool, the first time somebody flew. But we also <coughs> wouldn't say that we want to still be stuck with the Wright Brothers airplane, you know, 100 years later. So we have to go beyond the what, what that Model T was in 1972, we have to update for the Autobahn of today, and so how do we do that? All right. Yes, Thank you. 
the 10,000 lakes in, in Minnesota are incredibly strong uh, in terms of their legislative clout, as opposed to in Iowa where it's really the agricultural interests that have most of the clout. So uh, that I think accounts for the fact that they have been able to do more at the state level. Yes. I don't need that. I think it, I think maybe you turn off. I think we do have a very short of the thing. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, AJ gave it to me because I fixed the batteries. But so I'm a stereotypical farmer. I was a farmer until about 20 years ago. And um, I can't, well, not a lot, but uh, professors of uh, farm ec down at Iowa State, they would stand in front of the room and answer questions. And people would say, how much fertilizer? meaning nitrogen, should I put on NPK, should I put on my crops? And they'd say, well, it's fairly simple. It's marginal return. Every time you put a dollar's worth of fertilizer on it, you get a dollar and a penny back, and that's how you decide how much fertilizer to put on. Now, about half, you correct me if I'm wrong, of the Iowa corn crop goes into ethanol production. How do you fight against that? It sounds like a classic tragedy of the commons to me. Uh, there's no obligation on the part of the farmers to care about the water, the soil, or the air. How do you how do you get past that? You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, and so there really isn't any incentive for farmers not to plant the highest value crop that they're going to plan and to put on as much fertilizer as will get the most yield per acre that, that uh, they can. And so when I drive through the Lust Hills and you see, you know, slopes planted uh, that you know are highly eroded, you know, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not a good situation. Uh, and the amount of diversification of the crops in Iowa is, is really, really low. Um, so I don't have the answers. I think our panelists this afternoon will have a lot more really good things to say about sustainable uh, agriculture and, and, and things like that. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on it. But, um, but it is a situation that I think you're absolutely right, that we, you can be, I mean, I, I do not blame farmers. My, my family was, was farmers, and, and my uncle was a farmer, my grandpa was a farmer. I mean, I don't blame farmers because the incentives are there. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know, blaming me for taking the highest paid teaching job I can take, which I haven't done. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, people are going to do what the economics tell them. That's why I was talking about the market forces earlier. You really cannot just expect people, and, and, the, and the current nutrient plan that, that the governor has is based to totally on voluntary measures. And it's really kind of mind-boggling to say to people, you should voluntarily give up, you know, thousands of dollars an acre to do the right thing. It, it's going to be very difficult to, to see people do that. So uh, I think we have to get those market forces. You're right, it is a tragedy of the comments that we, we, we have this sort of single-minded belief in America that it's my land, I can do what I want to with my land, right? And that's American freedom. It's your but, land, but it's not your aquifer, it's not your river, it's not your lake, that's right. it's not your air. And we have, you know, we or have we recognized that in the cities with zoning regulations. I mean, you don't have the right to do anything with your with your city lot, you know? And you have to follow the regulations that we have in place that are based on community values and community good. Uh, and so we need to do the same thing with other types of, of land as well. So, let's see, was there another question? Do I need this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was born and raised in Iowa uh, and was moved to Wisconsin, spent 30 or 40 years there, and I've just returned in the last few years. So I, I do know that in Wisconsin they have a very strong a very strong coalition of, of right and left, uh, conservative and liberal, to uh, create lobbies to protect.
protect waterways because of the tourism and hunting industry and fishing is huge, which is the same in Minnesota. So I understand that that is different. But one thing, and so I want to, I have a two part question. One is I want to ask you about Illinois, uh, where, where they're coming in, and Kansas um, in terms of protecting waterways locally, statewide. But in, in terms of Wisconsin, the University of Madison had such a strong liaison a relationship between farmer and university that's been nurtured for years. And so they've been rotating crops and doing so many things for years that I haven't seen when I drive through Iowa uh, these days. And so I wondered why uh, Iowa State doesn't seem to have that same relationship with farmers. Or is that just... We, we have some friends from Iowa State in the audience that all that answer that. I, I don't, and, and I can't speak to that, but, but maybe maybe you want to comment on that now, or you want to save it for the panel this afternoon. Later? Okay. So I'm a recovering economist from Iowa State University. <laughs> I spent a quarter century there trying to figure out how to grow crops and protect them. Uh, and in that time, I saw a uh, massive reduction in public support for the public university sector, which made the uh, public university sector uh, quite receptive to the interests of modern groups and uh, the university is uh, trapped in a downward spiral of less and less public funding, and as a consequence of that, extension and outreach has been dramatically reduced, and uh, sources of funding for research related to agriculture have become more and more dependent on industry. So I think when you put those forces together, with less and less public expenditure on protecting environmental quality and developing environmentally sensitive production. <clears throat> with the um, interest of industry in steering the university and leveraging its research capabilities and reducing its outreach with regard to natural resource protection, you kind of get what you have to have. So if you want to invest in publicly related Research for agriculture that's in harmony with the environment and that supports family farms. I think uh, you have to see some changes in the legislature. I think uh, when you have political power concentrated in the border regions, such that the uh, Iowa Farm Bureau is the president of the border regions, you kind of know what you're going to get. My name is Jerry Thomas Berry, and I serve as chair of the Black Hop Soil Water Conservation District. And I must say, this, pre this presentation this morning has been really depressing. And I want to tell you some good stories about what we're doing in Black Hop County. We've had two long term grants one in Dryland Creek in the Cedar Falls area, which is an EPA 319 grant, and it's for a biological impairment. In we have installed many, many, many conservation practices. And our challenge is every time we get some area of that creek fixed, if you will, more development happens. And that, you know, we start all over again. Um, another story that we have is um, in Miller Creek in the southern part of the county, we started a water quality improvement grant in, in the 13, beginning of 14. And we now have over 25% of the acres there in that watershed, Middle Miller Creek watershed, with cover crops. And we have there, oh, Mike, is it two, three wetlands, I think, in the Miller Creek area? So we have been working really well with our farmers to install the conservation practices that matter cover crops, bioreactors, saturated buffers, um, wetlands, and we, I think, um, had a good relationship with our 
producers, and then they're beginning to see the impact of these severe weather events. And I was kind of flippant with one farmer when I said, you know, the next time the county has to come out and clean up your dish with your topsoil, I'm going to tell them not to give it back to you because you need to do something about it. And I think when you have a relationship with a farmer, you can say those kind of things and then say, hey, and now here's how you can keep your asset on your ground, for gosh sakes. Anyway, so there are some important things that are happening. We've recently received a perennial ground cover conservation innovation grant to put um, Kentucky Blue as a cover crop that will be a perennial. And so we're now doing a field trial. So we're really active, and I think many, many, many farmers in Blackhawk County really care about their water quality. But more importantly, we are targeting soil health. The, the crops that we raise today on our soil are so nutritionally lacking that we have to build up the soil profile once again. So it's just like we are making some progress, but there's a long ways to go. I remember when there was a, um, a change proposed for the waters of the United States. Holy you know, one of my commissioners told me that the EPA could come in and, and tell him he had to do something with the water that was flowing off of his driveway into the survival bridge. And I thought, oh, really? But anyway, um, I just want to, we have a good story here in Blackhawk. Not in all counties, I will agree, but we're doing some really good work here. Thank you. Thank you, and, and that is exactly what I mean by the sense of Let's not wait for Congress to act or for EPA to act. I mean, that's, that is fantastic and exactly what I'm talking about. It's just, let's just go ahead and do the things we know need to be done and take control of our watershed. So, I love it. I'm wondering about the uh, pollutants that run off the not, not point source and flow into the rivers and streams. Uh, what percent of that would you know or can estimate would be commercial uh, applications of fertilizer or herbicide or something, and how much would be attributable to manure? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, I imagine it varies quite a bit. I mean, I, I had the map that, that shows the, um, in, in just the raccoon watershed, you know, this, this <coughs> map that shows the, uh, where, where the nitrates are, are coming from, but I don't, I'm not sure that they've broken it down between manure and commercial fertilizer. I'm not sure. Maybe the scientists know what, more than I do, but I'm not sure how you could do that. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure how you could find out the information on whether, you know, because it's all going to come off as, as nitrogen um, or phosphorus, and so I, I'm not sure you could could identify whether it was coming from commercial or a manure. And I imagine it varies a lot from field to field, field, to field and even from year to year. Uh, I just have a comment. Uh, I've heard this before that uh, livestock produces a lot more animal than the people do. And uh, with all the confinement units in uh, Iowa, might be secure to figure 89 million, equivalent of 89 million people. So, yeah, one of our speakers has a has a uh, equivalent chart. Um, maybe he'll talk about this afternoon. That that is, um, you know, each each. So if you've got a, if you've got ten thousand hogs, it's the equivalent of having a city of forty thousand people, I think, or or even forty five fifty thousand people. And if we had a city of fifty thousand people, we just think of the municipal wastewater treatment plant that, that we would have, make them have. And instead, we have a lagoon um, that we just uh, then take out and spread on the fields. And so it is quite a remarkable thing that, um, that we are controlling human waste so carefully. And then we have the equivalent in hogs that are producing much more waste per capita uh, and are basically um, not controlling it very well. So I, I'm thinking of, I'm, 
going to be seventh grade in a couple weeks, but I remember the ads for pickup trucks or after politics and during girls' basketball. Uh, you know, when the line was you can't get two tons of fertilizer into a one ton truck, well, we're getting more than two tons of fertilizer into a one ton creek. Nobody's doing anything about it. But anyway, any more questions? I guess it's getting close to lunch, guys. So. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.